I'd like to thank the organisers for the invitation. Um, this is work in progress. Um, what I'm looking at in this paper is, is a model in which um, the agents that reside within the model um, have a particular type of aversion to risk. Okay? They can have risk-sensitive preferences. And we'll see what that means um, as the talk goes on. What I'm going to be interested in, are, uh, what are the general equilibrium effects of this risk sensitivity? Right? So I've got households in the economy and they're going to have risk sensitive preferences. And these preferences um, can have implications not only for their decision rules, but also for the business cycle. And they may have implications for how policy ought to be conducted. Right? Collectively, they may also have implications for asset prices. And asset prices and the returns on assets are going to be one of the more interesting aspects of this analysis. Okay, now, this is sort of work in progress, so comments are, are welcome. Right, so, as I mentioned, I'm going to have an economy that is populated by three types of agents. Okay? Um, two of these agents are going to be making intertemporal type decisions. One is a government and another is households. All right. When the government is conducting policy, and it's going to be fiscal policy here, they're going to be doing so without the ability to commit. Okay. So I'm going to be looking at a Markov perfect equilibrium. Right. Discretionary policy, if you like, <coughs> or a Markov perfect equilibrium. And the two agents in the economy, households and the fiscal authority, those that are making intertemporal decisions, I'm going to allow them to be risk sensitive decision makers. Right? So risk sensitivity doesn't matter for agents that are making static decisions. And the firm's problem here you'll see is going to be static. Okay? But the intertemporal decision makers are going to be risk sensitive decision makers. Okay? So they're going to be particularly averse to uncertainty of a, of a particular type that I'll show you. Where does this risk sensitivity come from? Well, you can view it as sort of part of individuals' behaviour, if you like. Or you can view it as a, a proxy for something else. Model misspecification, aversion to model misspecification. Okay? This type of robust control that you sometimes see in the macro literature. It, in a, a linear quadratic environment, the analogue in a non-linear environment would be something like risk sensitive preferences. Okay? Models of um, non-expected utility models of ambiguity aversion or uncertainty aversion also can be mapped into this type of risk sensitive preferences environment. Epstein's in preferences are a generalization on risk sensitivity that, that I'm working with. Okay? So we can view the risk sensitivity that I'm going to show you either as something that's inherent in preferences or you can see it as a, as a, as a, as a way of modeling other types of uncertainty in the economy. All right. So what I'm going to show you uh, the, are that the economic outcomes are going to be affected importantly by risk sensitivity. Okay? The risk sensitivity is going to induce a really strong precautionary savings motive. Right? So it's going to induce households to defer consumption and accumulate capital, and the accumulation of capital is going to affect the return on assets. Okay? But although it's doing that, we're going to find that the effects on the business cycle are pretty small. So the way the economy responds to shocks um, is not that sensitive to whether agents are risk sensitive decision makers or not risk sensitive decision makers. When I increase households risk sensitivity, this lowers the risk free rate, it lowers also the return on equity, but raises the equity premium. Okay? It does that provided I'm keeping the stochastic steady state for capital constant, right? So I'm generating this type of a, um, a mean preserving spread and uncertainty, if you like. Right? Risk sensitivity on the government side leads to an increase in government spending right? and taxation. Right? Yep. Um, so the government spending in this model, as you'll see, enters into household utility. Right? So it doesn't just disappear. Right? So the way that the government can help ensure households against 
a risky consumption stream is providing government services. Okay, so it ensures their, their lifetime utility in this way. Okay. So the paper that's most closely related to this is a, is a paper by Thomas Tellerini. <coughs> um, what he does is he uses a, a sort of a standard stochastic growth model and he introduces risk-sensitive households. And he shows that this risk sensitivity can have large welfare effects and that the model can account for a low risk-free rate. Okay. I'm going to find these results as well. Right. This paper by Croce is similar. It, um, it has Epstein-Zinn preferences, so it's a business cycle model, a stochastic growth model with Epstein-Zinn preferences, which as I mentioned are a generalization on risk sensitive preferences. They're going to generate the low risk free rate and a return on equity. It's not coming so much from the Epstein-Zinn preferences, but rather from capital adjustment costs. Okay. Now this paper that I'm working on is also related to the literature on optimal fiscal policy or Markov perfect fiscal policy in dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, right? and particularly those with balanced budgets. Okay. Now, the one final paper that I should mention is this paper by Justin Sveck. Right? So this is the first paper that I know of in which you've got two agents within a model that are both risk sensitive decision makers. So I've got that also. Sveck looks at a Ramsey type problem, whereas I'm looking at a Markov perfect problem. Okay? But there's obviously a connection. On the computation side, I'm going to show you a method based on value function iteration. The more standard way of solving these types of um, nonlinear models is to use either linear quadratic methods, which aren't so useful in the Markov perfect environment, or to use generalized Euler equations. Okay, now generalized Euler equations, the, you know, they're just a just like a standard set of first order conditions that you might get from a Lagrangian. Right? But they're generalized in the sense that you've got, you've got not just decision rules in them, but derivatives of decision rules. And this makes it a bit more complicated to solve. This type of approach is not really amenable to the inclusion of risk sensitivity. And you'll see why in a few minutes. Okay, so the model itself. Well, we've got three agents. Right? We've got households, we've got firms, and we've got a, a fiscal authority. Households are all going to be identical as our firms, right? So it's a representative agent type environment. We're going to have a rental market for capital and a perfectly competitive spot market for labour. Okay. The goods that are produced are going to be sold either to households for consumption and investment purposes or sold to the fiscal authority. In the latter case, these goods are going to be transformed costlessly into a government provided sort of consumption good. Okay? Now the fiscal authority finances their purchase of consumption goods by a linear tax on income. Right? So they're taxing the household's income. We don't allow them to impose lump sum taxes, right? nor do we allow them to finance deficits by issuing bonds. So I don't, it's a balanced budget model, right? So we don't have debt in here as an additional state variable. And as I mentioned, I'm going to allow households and the fiscal authority to have risk sensitive preferences, right? So here's what the households problem looks like. Right? So the households, it's got a choice about how much consumption, how much leisure, and how much labor to provide, um, and how much capital to take into the next period. Right? So it's going to be choosing this sequence to maximise its discounted lifetime utility. Now this looks pretty standard. The only thing that's different about it is the presence of this parameter theta here. Right? Now this is the risk sensitivity parameter. Theta is a value that's going to be negative um, and it, it characterises the household's aversion to, to risk. So what's the risk about? Well, if the theta wasn't there and then this, you know, this log and this exponential um, weren't there, then this would be just a standard recursive problem. Right? What, uh, and that, 
you know, because the expectation is just that this is linear in the probabilities, so it's like you're, you're risk neutral with respect to your continuation value. Right? So if you didn't have the risk sensitivity there, then you're saying that the household, there might be some curvature here, right? so they're risk averse in terms of their current consumption or their leisure, but they're risk neutral in terms of their continuation value. Okay? And what the risk sensitivity does is it introduces curvature over this continuation value. So it makes the agent averse to risk in their lifetime utility, if you like. Okay? And that's what it's going to try and protect itself against when it's making its decisions today. Right? So lowercase letters here are going to represent household level variables. Capital is going to be an aggregate level variable. Right? So G here is the government services that are provided by, by the fiscal authority. All right? So the household's going to be choosing this sequence to maximise this lifetime you know, utility function subject to its flow budget constraint, which is pretty standard, right? So we've just got this tax rate here. So this is their after tax um, return, or this is their income. There's a, uh, there's a deduction on, on the return the household gets for capital to allow for depreciation. And other than that deduction, their income is taxed. The tax rate is going to be time varying, okay? We've got a, you know, a, a time resource constraint, so the total amount of labour and leisure provided by the household has got to sum to one, and the household, of course, is taking prices as given because it's atomistic and perfectly competitive markets. Okay? So the only new parameter we really have here is this theta, right? this risk sensitivity parameter. Right. On the firm side, it's going to be a static problem. It's pretty standard, right? So we're going to have... It's going to be a neoclassical production function. It'll be Cobb Douglas when I solve the model. Right? We've got this technology shock that's going to follow an AR1 process. Now here it's a stationary process. Right? Later on, I'm going to introduce the case where this is a random walk. Right? Permanent technology shocks. Perfectly competitive markets for capital and labour. So the rental rate on capital and the wage rate to clear the market are just given by these expressions here. Right? Standard. Now the fiscal authority. Fiscal authority can't tax lump sum, right? So taxes are going to be distortionary, right? If the, if the fiscal authority could tax lump sum, there would be no time and consistency problem in the model because there'd be no, there'd be no distortion to worry about. <coughs> so we're going to have distortionary taxes. Taxes are going to be positive. Um, can't issue bonds. And then we've got this first mover advantage. So within a period, if you like, um, the government is going to move before households and firms within the period. Right? So we enter the current period. The current capital stock is known. The current level of technology is known. Then the government moves first. So it's going to be choosing its government expenditure and its taxes, right? subject to the budget constraint. And it's going to be doing, making its decision prior to households and firms making their decisions okay, within the period. Okay. Households and <coughs> firms are going to be making their decisions simultaneously. Okay. So, you know, when you think about that, then this first mover advantage, what the government's got to do is got to work out, well, how does this decision affect the other agents in the economy, what's their reaction to its decision, right? So we're going to be solving the model backwards within the period and then backwards over time, right? So what's the government's problem then? Well, the government's problem here is to choose this level of government expenditure to maximise the welfare of the representative household, right? And the representative household is a risk-sensitive <coughs> decision-maker, so we've got this theta present in the government's problem as well, in the fiscal authority's problem. It's also present. And then the, gov the fiscal authority's decision is constrained by this balanced budget condition. Okay. Any questions? All right. So later on, um, I'm going to allow this theta, the government's theta, 
you like, or the fiscal authority's data, to differ from the household's data. You can see how that matters. And that's a sense in which we can have two agents with different levels of risk sensitivity in the economy. I'm going to assume this functional form for the, for the households, right? So their, ISO, their, their utility function, their momentary utility function, if you like, is going to be of this isoelastic form, right? I'm going to assume that the production function is Cobb-Douglas. Then the household's problem boils down to this Bellman equation here. Okay, we've got the momentary utility function <coughs> and we've got this continuation value that um, has got the risk sensitive in there. We're solving the model for a Markov perfect equilibrium. Right? So the two state variables that are relevant for decisions are from the household's point of view, the level of aggregate technology and its own capital. Okay. And here's its flow budget constraint. So you can derive the first order conditions from this problem and then aggregate them across all households. And when you do that, you get <coughs> this expression here. Well, this is a form of the consumption Euler equation, right, or the Keynes-Ramsey rule, if you like. And here's the labor-leisure decision. Okay, now, the labor-leisure decision is a static decision, so it's not affected. The risk sensitivity parameter doesn't enter into this static decision problem. Obviously, the risk sensitivity will affect equilibrium outcomes for labor and consumption and so on, but the form of the first order condition is not affected by the risk sensitivity itself. Okay, but the risk sensitivity does enter the intertemporal decision, the household decision about how to allocate its consumption over time. And in particular, you can see you've got this adjustment here, that it acts like an adjustment to the discount factor. Okay? So one of the things that risk, risk sensitivity does <coughs> is it tends to make, make agents behave like they're more patient. Right? In terms of solving the model, you, you can see the thing that's tricky about it is you've still got this value function sitting in here. Right? It's still sitting in the, in the first order condition. You, you don't get the the value function eliminated from the problem. Right? We've got these three equations coming from the household's problem. Right? The firm's problem just generated these first order conditions for prices that we can substitute into the budget constraint and give ourselves a resource constraint. Right? The fiscal authority's problem is described by this Bellman equation. Right? It depends on the level of technology and the aggregate capital stock. Right? Other than that, it's of the same form as the household's problem. Right? Now, what are the constraints on the fiscal authority? Well, the constraints are its own government budget constraint, but it's also the first mover within the period, so it takes the reaction of the other agents in the economy into account when forming its decision, so it's also constrained by these equations here. Right? Solving the model backwards within the period we solve the households and the firm's problems, their first order conditions act as constraints on the first mover within the period. Okay? And it's going to be taking anything to do with the future as given, right? Because it's solving today and it takes the process by which policy is formed in the future as given. Right? So that's the form of the fiscal authority's decision problem. Right. How am I going to solve this? Well, I've probably got a slide on that. Uh, how do I parameterize the model? Well, the parameterization is pretty, pretty standard, right? So I've got alpha, this is the capital's share of output, right, 0.36. It's calibrated to a, I shouldn't say calibrated, it's parameterized. I'm not, cal I'm not fitting any moments here, right? So it's, it's parameterized. This is the quarterly depreciation ring. Okay. The subjective discount factor is 0.99. I've got basically my momentary utility function is it's like it's linear in logs. Okay. The reason I've done this is to 
mimic, if you like, the paper by Tellerini, but it also is going to be important for when I want to add permanent technology shocks for the existence of a balanced growth path. Okay? Here's some weights on leisure in the utility function, government expenditure in the utility function. Mm -hmm. These parameters are just chosen so that households spend about 40% of their time working and such that government expenditure makes up about 20% of total output. Now in the benchmark parameterization, I set the risk sensitivity parameter to zero. So I take the limit, I take the limit of this theta goes to zero. All right, so it just gives me a st standard um, recursive model for expected utility. Right? The, the technology shock is the only form of uncertainty in the model here. Its persistence is 0.95 and the standard deviation is 0.01. So everything here is pretty much standard. What I want to do is after I've solved this model is vary this risk sensitivity parameter. Right? And there's going to be some range of values over which I'm going to be able to vary that parameter and solve the model. It's not a huge range numerically, but in terms of its economic effects, it's quite, it's quite big. But every time I vary this parameter, okay, my model steady state is going to change. And in order to keep my steady state unchanged, I'm going to compensate for that by changing my discount factor. Okay? So I'm going to try and do all of my analysis over this risk sensitivity parameter, keeping the steady state of the model unchanged. Okay, so to solve the model, all of my unknown functional forms, thanks, are going to be um, approximated using Chebyshev polynomials. I'm going to use Gauss-Hermite quadrature for all of my numerical integration. I've got a range over capital, some nodes for capital and technology. Um, and I'm going to evaluate Euler equation accuracy using you know, this method of Ken Judd's. Okay. Now, to calculate the risk-free rate in the model, so the, the risk sensitivity is going to affect the returns on assets. Here it is in terms of the, this risk-free real rate. The theta appears in both the numerator and the denominator. This term here, you can see it's acting like a, an adjustment to this discount factor. My returns on equity, um, pre and post tax, are, are given here. Now, the theta doesn't appear directly in these expressions, but obviously the risk sensitivity affects the level of capital and labour um, and affects asset prices in that way. All right, so theta point, you know, minus 0.35, this was as large in an absolute value as I can make this parameter and still get the model to solve um, reliably. Okay. Here we have got the deterministic steady state of the model. Right now, the risk sensitivity is an adjustment for uncertainty, so it's the same whether you have risk sensitivity or not. When I introduce stochastic and no risk sensitivity, right, there's a small movement in the model to get a slightly higher level of capital, so there's a small precautionary savings motive going on in the model. When I introduce risk sensitivity, now I'm changing my discount factor to keep the steady state for capital the same, right? Most of the, you know, the variables on the, most of the real variables in the model aren't affected that much. Consumption goes down a little bit, government expenditure goes up a little bit, investment doesn't change that much because capital stock's not changing that much. Labor doesn't change that much because capital's not, right? So the capital labor ratio is going to be kept pretty much the same. Where the changes appear are on the asset side, the return on assets, right? So the risk-free rate is going down, right? The, the return on equity is also going down, but the equity premium is going up. Right? So the return on equity is going down by more than the risk-free rate. What's happening to decision rules? So the purple line here is for the benchmark model. So this is where theta equals zero, and this green line is where theta is minus 0.35. Right? So what's risk sensitivity doing? Well, for all levels of capital, which is to say for all levels of wealth, households cho choose to consume less, right? government spending <coughs> rises, and that increased government expenditure is financed by higher tax rate, a higher marginal tax rate. The return on, or the, the behaviour of labour is a little bit more complicated because 
I'm, I'm adjusting beta to keep the capital stock constant, right? So it's not a parallel movement. Um, it's just it's a change in the slope. There's also a slight increase in the steepness of this curve here and in this curve here. So taxation is becoming slightly more progressive. Right? But a fiscal authority that's concerned about you know, the welfare of households, where the household's a risk-sensitive decision maker, will increase taxes and, and, and provide households with government services as a substitute for private consumption. Okay. This shows pretty much the same thing, but it does in terms of not, not the decision rule, but in terms of the unconditional densities, right? So you can see that what the risk sensitivity is doing to the whole density, well, it's moving the consumption density pretty much parallel to the left, government spending pretty much parallel to the right. Now, it's not completely parallel, but a lot of the adjustments do look like that. Well, that sort of suggests that you know, if, it's just a, if it's just a change in first moment, right, then we're not likely to see much in terms of a difference in terms of um, vol variances and correlations, right? So for the business cycle, which is indeed what we see. Right? So if you look at the correlations from the model, these are correlations with output of various variables. Here they are for the case where you've got no risk sensitivity. That's uh, one, minute. one minute. I'm sure it said 10. <laughs> <laughs> this, is the case, this is the case where um, there's no risk sensitivity, and this is the case where they do. Well, there isn't much of a change here. Okay. So the risk sensitivity is not really affecting the business cycle that much. Uh, and if you for this value here, if I have, I'm a bit confused. So this theta has got to be negative, right? Yeah, it's got to, otherwise um, the model's not going to be well posed. It's not, you're not averse to risk anymore. You've got the curvature going the wrong way, okay? Um, no, it's, it, it might be modelling some other phenomenon, but it wouldn't be risk aversion or risk sensitivity. Okay? But it's not really affecting the business cycle that much. And that comes out in the impulse responses. Right? So the purple line is the benchmark response, the green line is the risk sensitive response. There's not a lot of difference between these. This is for a positive technology shock. I won't talk through it, but this is just looking at asymmetries. Right? between positive and negative shocks. There's not a lot in the way of asymmetry here. The biggest sign of asymmetry is really in terms of the response of investment, capital, and a little bit on, on output. Right? Well, what this says is that if you could solve this model using a linear quadratic method, your solution would probably be quite <coughs> accurate. Right? If only you could solve it using a linear quadratic method. Okay? I can't see that. <laughs> Two more slides, okay? So okay. On, the, on equity, so what's risk sensitivity doing here? Well, it drives down the risk-free rate, right? So it drives down the risk-free rate, it drives down the pre- and the post-tax returns on equity, and it's pushing up the equity premium. But it's only slightly. Here's theta zero, very small equity premium. Even when this is an absolute value now, so 0.35, well, you know, you've got a bigger equity premium, but it's pretty small in terms of basis points, right? So the risk sensitivity per se it is generating a large equity premium, but it's not giving you a lot, right? It's certainly not explaining the equity premium puzzle, okay? Now let's add permanent technology shocks, right? I had a, I had a station about persistence, highly persistent technology process previously. Now let's make that a random walk, right? I've got to normalise my model, resolve the model. I can only solve it now for value of, the largest value of theta I could handle was you know, minus 0.25. Right? But what's happening? Well, again, we get this decline in the risk-free rate. We get these declines in the pre- and post-tax returns on equity, but we're getting a much larger equity premium. Right? Permanent technology shocks by themselves are, just, are giving you a larger equity premium than in the case where the shock was transitory, but it's not huge. But you interact risk sensitivity with permanent technology shocks and you get a, a pretty decent equity premium out of the model. Okay? And I'll finish there. Mm.